Well, good afternoon and a blessed Thanksgiving Eve to all of you and folks watching online as well. Just a couple of announcements before we begin. First, thanks to Sharon Jackson. Uh, she's been played today. And Scott Eisenhower can play tonight to uh, give Miles a little bit of a break. Uh, he flew home to spend the holiday with his family in Georgia. So blessings to them and to all of us. It's a little bit different Thanksgiving this year. Um, many plans had to be adjusted and changed. Uh, but there are a couple of things. If you haven't yet picked up uh, one of these Advent devotion booklets, this is going to be our theme for Advent. Start Sunday. Uh, prepare the way. And uh, so each of each day it looks at one of the different hymns, uh, Advent or Christmas hymns or Christmas carols and the meaning behind that. And so that'll be a blessing. I encourage you to grab one for your family. And then also on where the offering plates are there in the doorways is a little invitation for you to take. Take as many of these as you need to invite someone to uh, come be a part of the Advent services, whether it's on Sunday or uh, on Wednesdays, we're just going to have noon services, <clears throat> and the kids are going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, are going to stay in their classroom and stream because we're trying to keep them separated. So uh, for safety's sake, but we'll have our service here noon on Wednesdays in the sanctuary. And this is uh, called the Perfect Gift. As we went through November here, we looked at God's many gifts to us, simple gifts, and kind of finished that series today with looking at the, the gift of God's creation to us. And, how we're called to be good stewards of, of his creation as well. Uh, it does have our holiday worship services uh, schedules on the back here, and it opens up and it says the perfect gift, and it talks about the coming of Christ. And so I want to encourage you to take one or two of these, maybe just keep them in your car and, or purse or pocket. You can share those, invite someone. You know, even if they can't physically get out, they can tune in online as well and be a part of that. Uh, Louise is right here, the servant of honor this week. She's been uh, going hither and yon to get all the goodies ready, uh, but uh, still could use helpers, right, Louise? So if any of you want to help, uh, you can talk to her, give her a call, or uh, shoot her an email. And, uh, but uh, throughout the day today, they'll be working on things, and then uh, obviously tomorrow morning as well. We can also use some helpers uh, Saturday at 9 o'clock. Put up the greenery around the balcony and put up the tree and all the decorate with the Chris Mons and, and uh, some of the wreaths and things out in the narthex. So if you're able to come Saturday at 9 o'clock, uh, get a good crew of helpers. We can usually do it about an hour, hour and a half. So hope you can come be a part of that uh, as well. So we're going to begin with the Thanksgiving hymn. Now thank you all our gods. I invite you to stand and we'll join in singing hymn. 895.
online service, page uh, 151 this morning, or this afternoon, as we gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I invite you to kneel, or you can be seated for a moment of personal reflection and confession. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with our intro. This is uh, selected verses from Psalm 104. and also points us how even creation looks to its creator uh, for the many blessings he provides. Psalm 104, beginning with the refrain verse 33 I will sing to the Lord as long as I live I will sing praise to my God while I have being O Lord how manifold are your works in wisdom have you made them all the earth is full of your creatures these all look to you to give them their food in due season when you give it to them they gather it up when you open your hand they are filled with good things when you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. And we stand and continue with the Kyrie. In peace let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy, for the peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord.
gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise and you may be seated. And as we think about creation, praising God, and we want to not only praise Him, but be stewards of that creation, we're going to sing verses 1, 3, 5, 6, and 7 of Earth and All Stars, hymn 8, 17. Thank you. 
God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Or as we just sang, he has done marvelous things. I too will praise him with a new song. Yeah, new song, old song. We want to gather and give him thanks and praise. And, you know, uh, I hope all of you are as blessed as Margie and I were each day reading one of the simple gifts, uh, devotions, and thinking about, not only about uh, thanking God for those, but, you know, it was, those were a stewardship series and reminding us that all those gifts and blessings that God pours into us, you know, our time and talents and, and treasures as we, you know, rededicated ourselves to serving God and, and our consecration Sunday, this last uh, Sunday. But also, I want you to think about today, God's creation and what a gift and what a, a blessing it is. And you know, I know uh, some of the governors and uh, mayors are encouraging people to uh, do their Thanksgiving outside. So I guess we have a, a really, uh, hopefully the weather might be nice for us to do that, you know, in terms of COVID safety. And say we're a little bit safer when we're out in God's creation. There's uh, not only having the open space, but I think uh, just uh, what sunlight does too, to, to help us be healthy and strong. You know, when, when God, uh, at the end of chapter one, Genesis says, you know, every single day he'd end each day with, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. But then when he steps back and looks at all of creation, he says, it was very good until sin. Until Adam and Eve sinned and sadly marred not and broke not only their relationship with God, but it marred and uh, broke their relationship with creation. And I'm going to share a few scriptures in a little bit that talk about how uh, you know, creation itself uh, is impacted by sin and death and, and suffering and all the things that, that came with it, you know, uh, suffering, violence, and some of the things, all the things you kind of dread, illness and disease, you know, like this coronavirus, all those things that came into the world when sin came into it. And, and yet, God did not abandon his creation. He certainly didn't abandon Adam and Eve. Remember, he's the one who came to seek them out. Adam, where are you? Where are you? And they tried to hide from God because they had that fear of God, the terror of God, not really the fear that we talked about uh, in recent weeks about loving and trusting God and that reverent fear for God, but wanting to hide from Him. But I want you to think, because today I'm going to talk about one of the ways we give thanks to God for his creation is by being good caretakers of his creation. Because here's something I want you to notice. Even before the fall, you know, that happens in chapter 3, where Adam and Eve sin, that's where it's recorded. But in, in the end of chapter 1, everything is very good. In chapter 2, God also tells Adam and Eve he has some work for them to do. It's right up here, verse 15 of chapter 2. Would you read that with me? The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Uh, that's a stewardship word there, to guard it, to watch over it, to protect it. In fact, we also see before the verse I started with, in verse 31 of chapter 1, where God says everything was very good. Listen to what he says, God says, in verse 28 of Genesis. And God said to them, to man and woman, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Here's two very interesting phrases. And subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over ever, every living thing that moves on the earth. To subdue, that means really you're, you're in charge. God says to us, you know, we are the pinnacle. Mankind is the pinnacle of all of his creation. Even when we look out at the amazing stars and constellations and all of that, God says, no, you human beings are the pinnacle. You're the top. He says, so you have dominion. You are to subdue it. And that word dominion, you know, in our, in our world today, the word dominion has so many negative connotations to it. And I always think about that word, actually, not just when I read this Genesis, but oftentimes when, 
when we have a wedding. And you said Josh and Lucy's wedding a couple Saturdays ago, and our banner's still up there. Uh, but you see it says Ephesians 5, verse 31, the two shall become one. Well, in that same chapter, there's also this idea of dominion. It says, husbands, you should you have dominion or headship over the wife. You know, and in our world today, we're all, that's not fair. We're all about equality. What does that mean? Does that mean the woman, the wife is not as important or as loved as the as the husband is? And the way the word, the word of God talks about dominion or headship, if you want to do that, look at it that way. Paul gives us a beautiful picture of it in the whole chapter, Ephesians 5. He says that Christ is the head of the church. That's dominion at its finest, at its best. And then Paul takes that lesson and he says, Husbands, you should love your wives, <clears throat> excuse me, as Christ loves his bride, the church. And then he says, He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church. Now sadly, in the fallenness of sin, even this God-given dominion or rule is misused and abused. And sadly in families, but also even in our role and our call to be stewards and caretakers of creation. You know, if you think about it, a lot of the issues uh, that we have with our environment are caused <laughs> by our sinful nature. Because we do things out of selfishness and concern only for ourselves, or you know, greed jumps in there, and, and sometimes we take advantage of this wonderful planet that God has blessed us with because we're thinking less about honoring God and obeying God, where he says care for this creation of mine, or we think more about ourselves than we do about our neighbors, you know, and if we're taking advantage of God's creation, how that actually is hurting and could be harming our neighbor. And yet, God's Word teaches us stewardship even of His creation uh, with the animals. Uh, in the psalm that I read for the intro today, uh, let me reread a couple verses there. It says, O Lord, how manifold are your works, and wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures, your creatures, you know, the, the animals, the plants, it's all a part of God's created creation uh, power and gift to us too. And then, that next verse that we read says, these all look to you to give them their food in due season. You know, even creation in many ways, uh, as the Psalms sometimes say, sing praises to its creator. And you know, sometimes you walk outside and look at the stars or you see a beautiful uh, field of wheat here in Oklahoma and you just go, wow, that, that is awesome. That is amazing. Uh, and yet, we also, uh, in Scripture, are, there's passages that talk about, especially since the fall, that um, there are times when we take even an animal's life to protect our own animals. Here's what, listen to what David said in, in 1 Samuel. He's speaking to King Saul, and he says, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And he rose against me. And I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Made me think of that. Did you see the guy who rescued his little puppy dog from the alligator on the floor? That's kind of what I, I thought of here. Yeah. So sometimes we we control plants or animals that would hurt our herds or you know our health or even uh, our happiness. But we want to do that in a God pleasing way as God pleasing stewards of of His creation. Listen to this passage from Hosea. This is Hosea 4, verses 1 to 3. And then I'm going to read from Romans. And so we've got one Old Testament passage and then one from the New Testament that talk about how creation itself is impacted, sadly, by our sinful human nature and our wants and our desires when we get out of tune with God. So Hosea said, Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Remember, we read earlier about God promising the land that they'd go in and it would be a blessing for them. But then when they abandon God and become all about themselves, the land is not everything God wants it to be. He says there's no faithfulness or steadfast love, no knowledge of God in the land. There's swearing, lying, murder, stealing, 
committing adultery, they break all bonds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Now listen to this, verse 3. Therefore the land mourns. Isn't that an interesting picture? And all who dwell in that language, also the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. And, you know, as we think about sometimes in the history of humanity and our lack of caring for God's creation has caused the extinction of some animals, some species, some plants. Paul in Romans 8 described it this way. For the creation was subjected to futility, to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. You know, that even God's creation <laughs> is anticipating in some ways when Christ returns and says, you know, this old order of ways that's impacted and affected by sin, affected by sin, is going to pass away. You know, he promises us new and glorious bodies, and he promises a new heaven and a new earth. Where again, we would perfectly steward that new creation. Now, I heard something the other day. Uh, I was watching the news and they had a picture of uh, the uh, Christmas tree in Rockefeller Plaza. Maybe you saw there was a little owl in there. You know, it's kind of famous now. But an owl, a little baby owl, rode all the way from up upstate New York. But anyway, um, so I wanted to share this, it made me think about this story, because they, they put this quote from a guy who basically said, uh, he is what I would call a secular humanist environmentalist. Now you and I should be environmentalists too, but we should be creationist environmentalists, worshipers of God, not worshipers of nature. So I'm gonna read this quote, and it comes from uh, a website called Earther, ismodo.com and this guy basically said we should get rid of Christmas trees especially the, the one that's in the heart of downtown New York he said this this year's tree so is also perfectly poised to reflect something more than our national mood it reflects the absolute toxic relationship we have with the natural world and the need to rapidly reverse course if this year's tree sees any justice it should be the last. In other words, first of all, how can a tree have justice? Again, are we worshiping the tree? Are we worshiping the creation? Or do we, as we understand truly from God's word, when we are caring for creation, we are actually worshiping the creator. And he goes on and says, everything about this tree tells a piece of the story of our past century plus relationship with nature and extractive capitalism. The tree came from I don't know how to pronounce this town, Wananta, I guess, New York, located 170 miles outside of New York City. It stood in someone's yard, a 75-foot giant amid an otherwise entirely uninterestingly ecologically destructive swath of lawn. And I clicked on that link too, and then it talked about how terrible it is to have a grass in your yard and what a waste that is too. So, like, you can't enjoy a, a yard either. It's not that some old growth native tree or remnant of the forest that grew where Oneida once stands. The tree is a Norway spruce, which, as you can likely guess from its name, is not native to the United States. That in and of itself reflects how amending our relationship with nature is. Its previous home, though, in its previous home, it had an iota of dignity, lost completely once it was transported to midtown Manhattan. See, it sounds to me more like they're personifying and worshiping the tree rather than the creator of the tree. But that doesn't dismiss us from taking good care and being good stewards of God's creation. You know, and I'm not going to get into a big debate about energy and all of that, because to be honest, I don't know that much about all of the energy resources and renewables, but I do know God wants us to be good stewards. Uh, and here in Oklahoma, of course, you know, we have both, don't we? When it comes, we have a lot of fossil fuel production, oil and natural gas, but you can't drive west without running into one of the big windmill farms now, too. And to be honest, that kind of sad to me, too. I know it's helping produce energy, but uh, that takes its toll 
on our environment too. You know, so weighing the pros and cons of renewables versus, you know, fossil fuels and, and natural gas and all of that too. And like I said, I'm not going to get into that too. Except to say, as Christian stewards of God's creation, we should try to be more informed. And it's been kind of a wake-up call for me. I'll share a few thoughts at the end too about how I think all of us could be three simple things we can do to be better stewards of, of God's creation you know and like we have a, a car that's a, uh, it's electric it's a hybrid and electric and gas I, I recently got rid of all of my gas power and guard tools uh, and I wish I could say it was totally environmentally uh, but I get I get tired of throwing my arm out trying to start my week <laughs> now so much nicer just to be able to push the button but it made me think about something is because I have not been very conscious about what do I do with batteries when they run out? I'll come back to that in a minute. Because even batteries take a toll on the production of the batteries to store power from the renewable sources. They're pretty hard on our environment too. The mining and the process of chemicals and all that they use. And so again, how can we be the best stewards of this wonderful, wonderful gift of God's creation? Because even though I may not know what's the best thing to do when it comes to energy, what I do and what you know too, what I do know and you know, is the Creator loves His creation. And that especially means me and you as the pinnacle of that creation. So what do we do? Well, you know, when it comes to the brokenness of our sinful nature, we recognize from God's Word how we need to be reconciled with God. You know, and that's really the main reason we gather today or tomorrow to thank God is for the relationship we have with Him that was also broken by sin. You know, it said Adam and Eve trying to hide from God. God comes to them, pursues them, and gave them that promise of the one who would come to bring that reconciliation. Remember His words as He spoke to the devil, Devil, one day the offspring of this woman is going to come you're going to strike his heel, but he is going to crush your head. He's going to make that reconciliation possible. You know, and, and one of the lessons we learn is that through our faith relationship with God, when that brokenness is fixed, it really helps repair brokenness in our earthly relationships with our fellow human beings. But also, it can be the empowerment, you know, our faith to be good and faithful stewards of his creation as well. So, I wanted to give you three R's to challenge you and myself <laughs> to be a better steward of God's creation. And uh, one of the ways we can do it is with plastic. Uh, I read an interesting article when I was kind of going through this. It said pretty much every human being on the planet uses plastic. Even in some of the most remote islands and remote places, plastic has made its way there. You know, whether it's floating trash in the, in the ocean that some, some native on an island somewhere has found and is using. Um, and these to me are probably the, our two most common. I mean, we use plastic all the time. And plastic is great. It keeps us alive, by the way. And it's one of the most common things that are used in medical uh, ways to, to protect us. But we use a lot of these plastic water bottles and a lot of these plastic shopping bags. So I'm going to give you three R's. And the first one is reduce. And this doesn't just apply to plastic. To think about ways, how can we reduce what we consume? You know, are there ways we can, we can cut back? You know, like at home we have a, a rain barrel to gather water when it rains to so help to use when we water our plants. It saves a little bit of, of water. Well, uh, I guess they figured out that it's okay to, to use reusable bags again now. I know during COVID that was, they said, oh no, you can't do that. There's all those germs there. You should disinfect those too. But, uh, or even just using paper bags rather than plastic bags because these take a long time uh, to get rid of. Or rather than using so many of these, I try, do try, this is one area where I try to use my own uh, reusable uh, glass or a water bottle or whatever, rather than using these. And then sometimes these are great and <laughs> a blessing too, but how could we reduce? How could we reduce? That would be one way to uh, be a good steward of God's creation. Uh, the other thing is, is simply to reuse them. 
So if you do have them, use something over and over again. Uh, and this is a little bit of side stewardship thing here too. Rather than always going out and buying something, you can borrow. It's okay to borrow stuff. Uh, borrow a tool from a neighbor rather than going by. Or reuse the things you can do. And, and I think we, we have become such a disposable society that it's just easier to throw it away and, and we start over. So, I mean, they even have reusable straws. You can get, you know, little steel straws that you can do. I don't recommend those paper straws. I don't know how that's going to be everywhere. <laughs> but then recycle. Recycle. You know, I'm glad in Oklahoma City we have recycling, you know, so you can do that. I encourage you to do that if you're not doing that. But here's, here's an area that I want to challenge. And maybe somebody in the congregation, maybe you want to take this on as a project. Like I said, even like batteries, because... Those are not something we want to just throw in the trash, even our one single-use batteries, but the rechargeables too, the chemicals and all that are in there. Maybe as a church, you know, we have our little uh, care corner over here. Maybe we should just let this be a place where people can bring uh, whether they're uh, you know, single-use batteries or rechargeable batteries and that. You know, you already do that with your car battery because you get money for it. Well, this is just a way not necessarily to get something back, but to give something as good stewards of God's creation. And again, a way to say thank you, God, for all the sacrifice you made for us. I can use some of my time to, to be a better steward, to reduce, to reuse, and to recycle. Because truly, if you think about it, as Christians, we of all people should be good environmentalists of this earth that we walk upon because we recognize who is the creator of this earth. Now look again at the theme verse there. I, in the slide I put bold and underlined. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And it's interesting, the word work can also be translated servant or serve. And the word for keep it can also be translated preserve, like to watch over keep it, to take care of it, to tend it, as we heard. So let me reread the verse this time with those two translations of those two verbs. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to serve it and to preserve it. Because as we heard throughout that Simple Gifts uh, series, what a blessing it is and to hear the master say to us as his servants, his stewards, in this area too, to be good and faithful stewards of his creation. Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. May his peace, the peace that passes all of our understanding, may it guard, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to confess our faith, joining in the words of the Apostles' Creed, mask up here, it's been getting ready to do communion shortly. And is this loud? Can you hear me okay still? Is that loud enough? Together we make that confession of our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sit at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And loving God, as we just uh, confess, we believe in you, the maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We pray that you would empower us, Holy Spirit, to be good and faithful servants and stewards of all your many blessings to us, our time, our talent, and our treasures. But also, Lord, as we remind you today in your psalm to be caretakers of the wonder of your creation of this earth that you have blessed us with. We also come to you today, Heavenly Father, lifting up our brothers and sisters in Christ. May you bring renewal of health and strength to those battling illness or disease or awaiting surgeries or recovering from them. Lord of life, may you give comfort and peace to those families who will be celebrating Thanksgiving tomorrow without a loved one for the first time. Uh, may you remind them of the victory that you have won, Lord Jesus, as our Savior and as our Redeemer. We also pray, Heavenly Father, uh, for our nation, prayers of thanksgiving for the freedoms that we do know and enjoy. And we give thanks for our servicemen and women, our police officers, our first responders, and all those who put themselves in harm's way on a day-to-day -day basis that we might know, enjoy, and live in the freedoms that we have been so blessed with. And finally, gracious uh, Holy Spirit, we pray that you prepare our hearts now to come to the Lord's table. As we receive in this bread and wine the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins and for strengthening us to live as his good and faithful stewards. In his name that we pray this. Amen. And as we uh, prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table now, we continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on that night when he was betrayed, and took bread, and when he gave it thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, O Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand for our prayer for Thanksgiving.